गुड मॉर्निंग एंड नमस्ते माय नेम इज शंकर यादव आई एम अ पीडियाट्रिक न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट आई एम वर्किंग एज एन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन पीडियाट्रिक्स डिपार्टमेंट बीबी गोयल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ हेल्थ साइंसेस टुडे आई विल डिस्कसिंग अबाउट न्यूरोलॉजिक सिंड्रोम वन ऑफ द कॉमन डिजीज इन चिल्ड्रन एंड द ऑब्जेक्टिव्स ऑफ टुडे सेशन इज लाइक वी विल डिस्कस ब्रीफली ऑन एपिडेमियोलॉजी व्हाट इज द न्यूरोलॉजिक सिंड्रोम डेफिनेशन Path of physiology. I will be just briefly touching about and uh, different etiology and clinical man- manifestation, as well as how are we going to investigate the cases, and how are we going to manage the case. So in detail, we will discuss regarding those things. <clears throat> so to start with uh, epidemiology, well, uh, it's a common disease with incidence of around uh, two to seven per hundred thousand children. And uh, the prevalence is about 12 to 16 per hundred thousand. Uh, it has been seen that it is uh, higher in uh, children from Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, as per the study which has been conducted in BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences, we have seen that uh, about six to eight percent of the annual admission is uh, because of the pediatric renal uh, conditions, and uh, of which uh, mark. Proportion that is about 35 to 40 percent. 40 percent is because of nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> so, um, how will you define nephrotic syndrome? Well, uh, it is the manifestation of glomerular dis- disease, and it is characterized by nephrotic drains proteinuria. Because of uh, nephrotic drains proteinuria, there are triad of clinical findings, uh, which is associated with large urinary loss of protein, and those are hypoalbuminemia, that is, albumin should be Less than 2.5 gram per deciliter. Uh, there must be anus arca or edema, and uh, hyperlipidemia with serum cholesterol of more than 200 mg per deciliter. To label it as uh, nephrotic syndrome, all of these parameters must be present. <coughs> so now uh, we are uh, moving forward to with the pathogenesis of the nephrotic syndrome. Uh, so if we see uh, the kidney. Um, uh, So you can see this is uh, cortex and uh, this is medulla. So glomerulus is usually present in the uh, cortical area. It's, it's present in the cortical area, and uh, we'll just briefly dissect this component, and we'll see that. Uh, so this is a nephron, and uh, this part is the glomerulus. Uh, it's not back. Okay. So uh, you can see here. Uh, The glomerular. This is this is basically the glomerular visceral membrane, and it has two layer. That is a visceral layer and a parietal layer. So this is the visceral layer, and this is the parietal. Layer. So we'll just take a cut section, brief cut section here, and we'll see cross uh, how it looks like. So if you see here, well, uh, the the visceral uh, DVM uh, layer is basically constituted. They they are made up of podocytes. So you can see here podocytes, and it's Uh, it contains a lot of food processes and particles. So in um, nephrotic syndrome, the problem is here. So either it's because of uh, the mutation in the gene which produces uh, podocytes or particles, uh, and or because of some immune factors, circulating immune factors which damages these particles. Uh, there is loss of these particles as a result uh, the albumin leaks. So that is the basic uh, pathology. And it's a bit easy to understand right? all these presentations. <clears throat> so, along with uh, that uh, pathological uh, things that happens in the kidney, uh, there is ne- because of that there is nephrotic transportinuria. Now, how are we going to label? The, is it a nephrotic transportinuria or not? So, first thing is to uh, do a 24-hour urine sample. So, how we do 24-hour urine sample is like we'll ask the uh, parents to. Make the children void the uh, urine right from the morning. So we are going to not collect the first void, but uh, tomorrow morning. That's after 24 hour when he gets up, he is uh, going to is uh, going to urinate in the in the uh, bottle provided for 24 hour urine collection. So so that's how we collect 24 hour urine sample. And if we process it, if uh, The 24-hour urine protein excretion is more than one gram per meter square per day, or 
uh, that is more than 40 mg per liter square per hour or if we just do a spot using protein creatinine ratio if it is more than 2 is to 1 ratio or a simple uh, protein dipstick which is a point of care test if it is more than or equal to 3 plus we will uh, label it as a nephrotic sensitivity so we can do by any of the methods to, uh, to see that okay there is a nephrotic sensitivity in there. <clears throat> so now uh, edema as we know is one of the one of the most important significant manifestation of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, it is because of the edema that the uh, uh, that the child are brought to the uh, clinician for the clinical care. Uh, so we are going to see why there is edema in nephrotic syndrome. So uh, there has been a lot of hypothesis uh, over the years and um, like uh, the initial hypothesis was underfill hypothesis. So according to this, so what was there is because of proteinuria, uh, there is a loss of alumen and uh, there is a decrease in oncotic pressure and there is shift of uh, interest, intravascular plasma into the interstitial volume. As a result, this will cause edema. So this in turn uh, will cause uh, low plasma volume uh, and uh, will cause decreased G, uh, GFR and the counter regulatory mechanism will activate such that uh, there is increase uh, increase sodium and uh, increase uh, water absorption as a result there will be restoration of blood and plasma volume and again that will leak into the interstitial space so this is how the cycle will continue and the interstitial uh, volume is going to increase uh, but this theory has been a uh, challenge from time to time and uh, now it is widely uh, accepted hypothesis is overfill hypothesis so in overfill hypothesis it is not just the decrease in oncotic pressure which causes the intravascular shift of uh, fluids to the interstitial space but it is because of the changes or disadaptation of uh, tubules to the sodium absorption and water absorption which causes enhanced sodium and water absorption and which in turn results in increased plasma volume increased plasma volume and blood volume so uh, so the difference was that initially uh, in underfill hypothesis the plasma volume and the blood volume was supposed to be low but uh, uh, on the other hand it was found that ideally in nephrotic syndrome the intravascular volume is high and uh, uh, not low so now it is the widely accepted hypothesis of hypothesis rather than nephrotic. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, we also know that in nephrotic syndrome uh, there is also uh, high cholesterol, and that is because of uh, the different factors that uh, uh, occurred in nephrotic syndrome. And uh, we know that there is loss of uh, uh, live protein, lipase, and lipids, and uh, uh, albumin in the albumin in the urine, and that causes disadaptation. Uh, in a lot of places, like uh, there is decrease in hepatic lipase, there is decrease in LDL receptor, HDL receptors, along with increase in angiopoietin, uh, uh, angiopoietin 4. So, uh, all this causes like uh, decrease uh, live protein lipase ex expressions and activities. Finally, it uh, contributes to decrease in fatty acids delivery to fats and muscle tissues. As a result, fatty acids increases in the blood. Similarly, it also causes impaired VLDL and impaired VLDL and chylomacrin clear, uh, clearance, and uh, as a result, there is hypertrichosis. So the process is quite complex, but we have to understand that um, uh, in uh, there are there are a lot of contributing factors which causes hypertrichosis and in turn hypercholesterolemia in child with nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> so now moving on to etiology. Okay. In uh, childhood nephrotic syndrome, it is quite different from adult nephrotic syndrome. The first thing we have to understand is uh, that in child children, we generally find primary or idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, uh, which contributes to about 80% and relatively uh, less number of uh, secondary nephrotic syndrome. So, in uh, primary or idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, again, another important factor is the minimal sense disease. Uh, is present in more than 80% of the cases that is a good thing for the children uh, in the management. Uh, similarly, uh, there is messenger proliferative glomerulonephritis, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, membranous nephropathy uh, and membranous proliferative glomerulonephritis that 
in relatively less proportion which contributes to primary nephrotic syndrome. Uh, secondary causes may be because of infectious like hepatitis B, C, malaria, syphilis, toxoplasma, different inflammatory causes like glomerulonephritis, other immunological causes like uh, bee stings or even food allergens, lots of neoplastic causes, lymphoma, leukemia, and uh, it could be because of drug induced itself, like uh, because of penicillin, gold intake or NSS intake, uh, or intake of mercury or lithium, uh, all this. Uh, Toxins can in turn uh, produce uh, secondary nephrotic <clears throat> So, clinical manifestation it's uh, quite obvious here. What we can see here is uh, uh, definitely like this anasurface. So, there's ascites, there is facial periovite edema. They will have a classical history of edema for a long duration, maybe of two or three weeks duration, with uh, edema starting from face, and uh, most of the edema uh, is. Uh, noted during the morning and as the day pro progress the, they will uh, classically complain that the edema of the face decreases uh, the common ease of presentation is between one to five years and um, there is decreased urine output urine that is produced is frothy because of the presence of albumin and um, usually in idiopathic and the primary nephrotic syndrome the growth is normal and uh, blood pressure also seems to be normal <clears throat> so how do you investigate this so uh, when a child comes with you with the history of uh, generalized uh, edema or anasarca for uh, weeks then we have to first thing we have to do is test the urine sample so but we will see that uh, urine albumin will be uh, more than 3 plus it may be 3 plus or 4 plus serum similarly uh, there may be some microscopic hematuria in about 30 percent of the cases and few wbc can be seen so we should not confuse it that okay since wbc is seen it is just a uti so whenever there is any glomerular uh, problem uh, in about 20 percent of the cases we we are bound to find some amount of uh, wbc in the urine <clears throat> uh, if we do a serum investigation definitely we will get a, a low albumin that is less than 2.5 gram per deciliter and serum cholesterol of more than 200 milligram per deciliter that satisfies the criteria for diagnosing a nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> Apart from that, we'll definitely do a complete blood count uh, to see if there's any uh, investigations. Similarly, to see uh, for uh, the neural function test, we like to do a urine, urea and creatinine. And if there is gross hematuria uh, along with albuminuria, we definitely have to do C3 label because post infectious glomerulonephritis is another important. Uh, entity, uh, renal entity that is commonly seen in children in our setup. <clears throat> uh, we need to do a chest x-ray and mantox because uh, we have uh, to start uh, steroids and uh, definitely this is the endemic zone of tuberculosis. We actually want to rule out for that we are doing a mantox test. If necessary, uh, we would like to do HIV, SBCG and ENA. Uh, if any clinical features are suggestive, if there is any high risk, then definitely we have to go for this test also. <clears throat> so this is a simple urine dipstick. So what you can do is just, uh, you can get this uh, urine dipstick um, in uh, the pharmacy. Uh, so this dipstick is basically a point of care test. Uh, you have to dip it in the urine and uh, take it out and just see the protein portion. So here we are seeing the protein portion. So after one minute you have to take the read reading. So here this color matches with this. So it is just one plus. Okay. So in nephrotic syndrome we will find a color of this or this. So what we are going to uh, expect in nephrotic syndrome is either this color, this color or this color. As 3 plus or 4 plus, which is uh, indeed parallel to a uh, protein concentration of 300 to 1000 milligram per deciliter or more than 1000 milligram per deciliter. <clears throat> so, in nephrotic syndrome, while managing nephrotic syndrome, there are certain terminology that is very important to know. Uh, first is remission. So, when we are going to call remission, so if we start a therapy uh, that is steroid, which is given for nephrotic syndrome. And if urine protein uh, 
becomes stress or nil or less than 4 mg per meter square per hour for 3 days along with the resolution of edema we are going to call it as a remission uh, on the other hand relapse is just the opposite of that that is if uh, the urine protein uh, if the child becomes edematous and if urine protein is 3 plus or 4 plus or more than 40 mg per meter square per hour for 3 days we will call it as a relapse similarly frequent relapses so uh, frequent relapses are those who show two or more relapses in initial six months or four or more relapses in any 12 months period um, well any case which have less than this that is less than two relapses in six months or less than four relapses in 12 months period will label them, them as an infrequent relapse so who has steroid dependence so uh, when there is a two consecutive relapses when on alternate day steroids or within 14 days of its discontinuation will label them as a steroid dependence and steroid resistance are those cases which fail to respond uh, to prednisolone of 2 mg per kg per day or 60 mg per meter square per day for 4 weeks. So once we start the therapy of uh, first episode of nephrotic syndrome, we are going to see uh, some courses over the follow up. So there are mostly steroid res responsive, that is steroid sensitive. So in 90% of the cases, if we give steroid, they are going to respond properly and edema is going to subside. Whereas about 10% of the cases are not going to respond and they will be labeled it as a steroid resistance. Among steroid responsive, there may be single episode of nephrotic syndrome in 25% of the cases. They are quite lucky, but the definitely the volume the, or the proportion is very less, that is 25%. On the other hand, 75% are going to have relapses. So that is an, one of the important key point that we have to take that they are going to relapse. And out of these, 50% of the cases are going to be infrequent relapses, whereas significant that is 50% of the cases are going to receive steroid for a long period they will behave as a frequent relapses or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome <clears throat> so now uh, do all cases of uh, nephrotic syndrome requires a renal biopsy the answer is obviously no so there are particularly in particular indications for renal biopsy that at so when any patient present to us and if at onset the child is less than one year or we even do renal biopsy in a uh, child of more than 10 years here our protocol is like that also so, and if there is a gross hematuria at presentation or if there is persistent microscopic hematuria or low C3 level we have to go for a renal biopsy and usually in minimal sense nephrotic syndrome we are not getting hypertension if you get a hypertension uh, in nephrotic syndrome, a biopsy is indicated. Similarly, a renal failure which is not attributable to hypovolemia should be biopsied. And if we suspect a secondary cause, uh, maybe because of uh, SLE or uh, C3ZM, we have to do a renal biopsy. So once we start therapy and uh, after the initial treatment, if suppose proteinuria persists for more than four weeks, of daily steroid that is if they become steroid resistant they have to do a renal biopsy similarly before starting therapy with uh, calcineurin inhibitor that is cyclosporin e or tacrolimus we have to do a renal biopsy so these are the particular indications for doing a renal biopsy and we must be all aware of that <clears throat> after that uh, we are going to discuss about the management which is very uh, important uh, well when we are doing the management in case of first episode of nephrotic syndrome, first thing is we have to rule out infection. So, child should not have any infection, no fever, no peritonitis, no pneumonia. We have to rule out, we have to see for additional atypical features like uh, any rashes or weight loss or uh, features of SLE as such. And if uh, nothing is present or if infection is cured, we have to start. A standard dose of prednisolone at 2 mg per kg daily for six weeks first and after six weeks we have to give a prednisolone of 1.5 mg per kg 
verse 6. So along with fitness alone, giving antacids or uh, dantidine or pantoprazole is being seen. But ideally, it is not important to give any medication apart from penicillin during treatment of first episodes. If there is any feature of gastritis, definitely we have to treat it. The best way is to give penicillin with food or immediately after. <clears throat> uh, in my day to day practice, I really encountered gastritis with penicillin. So, suppose a child. Uh, you have treated the nephrotic syndrome and after three months steroids okay steroids have been stopped and after three months again return back with the same swelling which is quite obvious in nephrotic syndrome 75 percent of the cases you know that they are going to relapse so how you are going to treat it okay so if there is any infection you have to first treat the infection and then start steroid at that is prednisolone at 2 mg per case per daily till remission so remission as we have discussed it is uh, negative or tres urine protein in their sticks uh, for three consecutive days along with resolution of urine. So once you get uh, a negative or tres albumin, uh, the next thing is you are going to switch over to alternate day. That is 1.5 mg per kg alternate day for four weeks. So usual duration of treatment of relapse is about five to six weeks and it's uh, easy, not that difficult. So I think all of us can treat infrequent relapse nephrotic. <clears throat> So now, uh, how we are going to treat a little bit difficult part that is frequent relapse nephrotic syndrome or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. So for that, again, first thing is that you have to treat any infection. Treating infection is one of the important component. And then we are going to start again, similarly, 2 mg per kg daily of prednisolone till the remission, followed by alternate day prednisolone of 1.5 mg per kg for 4 weeks. So it is almost similar like treating any relapse like any infrequent relapse like even infrequent relapse nephrotic syndrome we discuss we treat like this one so after that however in case of frequent relapse nephrotic syndrome we are going to taper the steroids that is penicillin slowly at 0.25 mg per kg every four weeks and then we have to assess the steroid threshold suppose the threshold is less than 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg alternate day that means that we can decrease the steroid to less than 0.75 to 0.7 mg per kg and there is no remission then we are going to continue with the steroid but if the threshold is very high that is we are we have to give a steroid of more than 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg and if there is sign of steroid toxicity so we have different options so when the threshold is low, we are going to continue the steroid for 9 to 12 months. If the, there is high threshold, there is definitely the child has a prone of uh, getting steroid toxicity. So we have to start or we have to add on alternative drugs. So another important thing is, is it important to do a renal biopsy in case of frequent relapse nephrotic SDNS, steroid dependent nephrotic Definitely not. When we we should not perform renal biopsy in these cases when there is a feature of steroid toxicity or when there is high threshold of penicillin required we have to start alternative variables so i will briefly discuss about the alternative therapies <clears throat> so uh, these are the till now we have this available uh, alternative therapy levamisole cyclophosphamide cyclosporine Tacrolimus, mycophenolic morphetal, and rituximab. So, all these alternative therapies are available and we can use as per the indication. <clears throat> so, now let's uh, see, let's discuss on like uh, which agent, which immunosuppressive agent to choose when we are starting alternate immunity suppression. So, uh, Levamisole. Levamisole is a drug, it's an anti aluminic drug which has been shown to have some immunosuppressive property. And um, this is widely used in Asian uh, subcontinent uh, for alternative immunosuppression in case of frequent relapse nephrotic syndrome as well as in steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. Uh, cyclophosphamide is preferred especially in uh, when there is a significant steroid toxicity 
when there is severe relapses and there is features of hypovolemia or thrombosis and uh, if there is a poor compliance and if there is a difficult to follow up we tend to prefer cyclophosphate whereas cyclosporin A is preferred if the patient continues to show steroid dependence or frequent relapses or in steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome and similarly tacrolimus is preferred in adolescent age group and it has the same action of cyclosporin A so levamisole uh, the dose is 2 to 2.5 mg per kg alternate day for 12 to 24 months along with a uh, tapering dose of alternate day steroids should be continued while giving levamisole there is significant reduction in relapse rate and moderate steroid sparing effect there are few side effects like leukopenia flu like symptoms liver toxicity skin rashes rarely convulsions in my practice i have seen that we get skin rash but other thing like leukopenia or any other side effects i have not seen till this <clears throat> we have to monitor cbc complete blood count every 3 monthly in case of levamisole therapy so cyclophosphamide is another important uh, immunosuppressive agent which uh, can be given both in oral form as well as iv form uh, the oral dose is 2 to 2.5 mg per kg per day for 12 weeks this should be given along with uh, tapering dose of penicillin it is a very good drug and we have seen sustained remission in more than 50% of the cases in and the remission may last from 2 to 5 years that is a very good thing however the drawback is it has significant side effects like uh, leukopenia alopecia and gonadal toxicity however the gonadal toxicity is seen in limited cases when we are giving iv pulses we have seen that the, uh, the child may suffer from vomiting hemorrhagic cystitis is very rare we have uh, we by using mesna basically we decreases the rate of hemorrhagic cystitis uh, the very important component in monitoring is we have to do our total leukocyte count every two weekly and uh, we have to discontinue the cyclophosphamide if the tlc count is less than 4000 or cubic mm uh, the child should be advised for increased fluid intake and uh, frequent voiding while taking cyclophosphamide <clears throat> cyclosporin a or this is a calcineurin inhibitor uh, the dose is 4 to 5 mg per kg per day Uh, this should be given for 12 to 14 months with alternate the tapering dose of prednisolone the good thing of cyclosporin is it is available in the seto form so in children less than 5 years who are not able to take oral tacrolimus oral form uh, the cyclosporin is pre- preferred the very important thing is like 85% of the cases responds to cyclosporin a and uh, there are side effects in cyclosporin a which we have seen like there is cosmetic side effects increased growth of hair um hypertrichosis hypertension nephrotoxicity it can cause nephrotoxicity hypercholesteremia and constipation are few of the side effects of cyclosporin a we have to monitor creatinine level lipid profile uh from time to time and uh, cyclosporin label should be done and the level should be the blood level of cyclosporin level should be maintained between 80 to 120 nanogram per ml uh, if we need to like uh, increase if we need to continue uh, giving cyclosporin a we have to do a renal biopsy uh, before considering to continue the cyclosporin a. this is same for the tacrolimus also uh, it is available in the capsule form and the dose is 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg per day for 12 to 24 months the common side effects are hypoglycemia neurotoxicity and diarrhea so um, those cases who have history of seizures which are very concerned or prescribed tacrolimus uh, they are preferred in adolescent because they have very uh, low cosmetic side effects although we have to monitor glucose and creatinine every 2 to 3 months another important drug is mnf 
The dose is 800 to 1200 milligram per meter square with tapering dose of steroids and it can be given for 12 to 24 months. Uh, they have a common side effect like leukopenia, diarrhea, GA upset. We have seen the gastrointestinal uh, side effects very frequently in MRI. Um, there is no nephrotoxicity or neurotoxicity or hepatotoxicity uh, or cosmetic side effects. Uh, we have to monitor TLC every two months. <clears throat> Rituximab is, uh, is indeed an expensive drug, but it's a promising drug uh, which can be given to a case of steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. It has even uh, tried in case of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. It is basically an anti CD20 monoclonal antibody. The dose is 375 mg per meter square. It can be given in two doses, two weeks apart. We have to watch for hypersensitive reaction during inf infusion and infections. So those, uh, we discuss about the drugs, uh, primarily the steroid as well as the alternate immunosuppression that can be given to spear the steroid side effect as well as uh, in case of steroid rest nephrotic syndrome. So another important component of uh, nephrotic syndrome is management of edema because the child is going to present with edema. So whenever child present with edema and we are going to start the management of edema, the first thing we have to look is, is there hypovolemia? So we have to see for the features of hypovolemia, okay. The child may be swollen, but there may be intravascular hypovolemia. So we have to check like what is the pulse, is there any tachycardia, how is the perfusion, what is the capillary refill time, is it maintained or not. Uh, we have to check for blood pressure, so if the patient is hypovolemic, if there is tachycardia, BP is low, we have to give a rapid infusion of normal saline as we do in management of other hypovolemia. And uh, if after giving uh, two boluses of 20 ml per kg of normal saline, if it doesn't improve, we have to start albumin infusion. <clears throat> but in majority of the cases, we have seen that there is no hypovolemia. So when there is no features of hypovolemia, we are going to start diuretics. Uh, to decrease the edema. So the first drug of choice is furosemide, which is uh, available in the form of Lasix. Uh, we start with tablet, 1 to 3 mg per kg per day, and we may add spironolactone 2 to 4 mg per kg per day, if required. If suppose, despite of giving uh, a furosemide and spironolactone for 24 to 48 hours, the edema is not improving, what we can do is we can double the dose of furosemide. To 4 to 6 mg per kg per day, along with that spine lactone or hydrochlorothiazides or metallosome could be added. If the oral therapy doesn't work, we have to start with IV furosemide. So, be before giving IV uh, furosemide infusion, one bolus is of 1 to 3 mg per kg per dose is required. After that, we can continue infusion and 0.1 to 1 mg per kg per hour for 24 to 48 hours as required. If suppose all of the therapy fails, then we have to institute 20% albumin. Albumin is expensive drug. 100 ml of um, albumin costs around 8,000 uh, Nepali currency. So, uh, so all if all the other options are exhausted, we have to we are going to give albumin. Along with that, we have to give uh, diuretics, IV acid, IV furosemide is indicated. So this is how we are going to manage uh, edema in case of nephrotic. <coughs> So along with these specific therapies, supportive therapy is indeed important. Uh, we should consider adequate protein and calorie for ease. Fat consumption should be less than 30% of calories. Adequate fluid intake should be there. So uh, there is a practice of restricting fluid in case of nephrotic syndrome. Some believe that uh, the child is already edematous. So if you give too much of uh, fluids, again the edema will increase. It is not like that. We have to give adequate fluid intake maintain adequate fluid in it. It is not important to give high amount of protein. So that is another important uh, uh, practice that is commonly seen. So since there is loss of albumin in the urine, we have, we have to give more uh, more protein. So that is the concept. So that is not actually the concept. We have to give a normal protein intake, uh, recommended protein intake per day. Uh, the very important component is salt restriction. So in case of edematous state, we have to restrict the salt. 
immunization is very important avoid live vaccine uh, important thing to consider is that you should avoid the live vaccines when the child is on immunosuppressive therapies and uh, they can be given four weeks after stopping steroids and if we consider to give the vaccine it is important that the child is in the stage of remission not in relapse stage don't give any uh, vaccine when the child is having relapses so another supportive uh, therapy is like we have to educate parents like uh, how to uh, measure the urine albumin so they should be able to do urine dipstick and they should be able to uh, write it properly uh, it is very important part to make them participate in management of, of their own child that enhances the uh, efficacy of the management uh, we have seen that uh, many children uh, before developing gross edema the parents are bringing the child to us saying that okay the, although the child is not edematous the urine dipstick has now become 2 plus or 3 plus what to do so that is pretty important because uh, if we manage the case early uh, there is less chances of infection and uh, less chances of developing uh, anasarca and uh, other side effects too <clears throat> so we have to counsel the parents because uh, see nephrotic syndrome is uh, not a uh, it's not a piece of cake like uh, they, they are going to say so relapses in 75 percent of the case and they, they, they are going to make it frequent visits uh, to the hospital so we have to say that okay relapse is a rule but it is not that uh, the kidney is damaged uh, we have to say that there is usually no risk of renal failure we have to uh, give a uh, medication for some period of time so that after that time uh, the edema will will uh, start decreasing and uh, we have to also explain about the side effects of drug and uh, we have to tell them the risk of uh, frequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome and steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome the most important part is like follow up we have to we have to keep the child in proper follow up uh, so that they don't develop complication so next thing is basically complication <clears throat> so what are the common complications that you are going to see in your day to day practice so it, it may be because of edema like uh, there may be so much of edema like uh, because of it they can be scotal swelling there may be massive ascites causing difficulty they can be pleural effusion they can be pericardial effusion because of which there may be some respiratory difficulty similarly um, there may be gross facial edema uh, edema of uh, bleed eyelids which may impair the vision so edema itself can cause a lot of complications so, uh, they are also prone to infection so they can get cellulitis peritonitis pneumonia we should be very clear for that uh, thromboembolic complications are also quite known in case of nephrotic syndrome so they can develop all thrombosis like ren deep vein thrombosis renal vein thrombosis cerebral venous thrombosis so uh, and if uh, proper fluid is not given they can develop hypovolemia and acute, acute renal failure so these are the uh, complications that may arise because of the disease itself the complication could be because of the disease as well as because of the steroid tox steroid itself because we are in case of frequent relapse nephrotic syndrome or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome they are going to receive steroid for long duration of time and it is obvious that they may develop uh, steroid toxicity uh, in the form of Cushing syndrome stunting hypertension diabetes cataract, immunosuppression, osteopenia, peptic ulcer disease or we, we may get a lot of mood changes when uh, child take steroids. <clears throat> so um, finally the take home message is in children nephrotic syndrome is a common entity in day to day practice and one of the common condition leading to hospital admission. The important thing in Children or childhood nephrotic syndrome is they are usually primary idiopathic and out of them most of them are minimal cells. So that is an important thing that should be taken care of. They, should, they respond, about 80% of the cases respond very well to steroids. However, like treating first episodes of nephrotic syndrome is just not treating nephrotic syndrome because we are by now we know that 75% of the cases 
are going to relapse. Relapse is the rule. So supportive care, counseling to the parents and adhering to long-term follow-up is very important. Apart from that, monitoring for steroid toxicity, starting immunosuppressive, alternate immunosuppressive therapies in time and doing a renal biopsy in an indicated cases is very important. What we need to understand is if we are going to treat the nephrotic syndrome, treat the relapses of nephrotic syndrome properly, usually most of the nephrotic syndrome, more than 80% of the nephrotic syndrome, they resolute by adolescence and we are not going to see the relapses after adolescence. So that is the key message that should be taken. And another important thing is nephrotic syndrome is not a renal failure or kidney failure. Most of the parents, even the doctors or healthcare workers are quite like, uh, they, they feel that it may result in renal failure in a long time, but it is not so. If we treat the nephrotic syndrome properly, it is going to show a good result. With this, I'd like to thank you uh, for being with me for this presentation. Um, if, they have, if you have any queries regarding nephrotic syndrome, or if you want to know more about nephrotic syndrome, or when you have any complication in managing nephrotic syndrome, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you can contact me in my with my email address that is sankardharan at the red email.